Hi. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first session of Health Matters. We're so delighted that you could all join us today for this exciting program. My name is Lori Goler. I have the great privilege of serving on the hospital board here at Stanford, seeing firsthand the extraordinary patient care that is delivered at the hospital every day. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ewan Ashley. Dr. Ashley is an associate professor of cardiovascular medicine and genetics, and he's the director of the Stanford Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Disease. Among his many honors, Dr. Ashley has been recognized at the White House for his contributions to personalized medicine and has also been the recipient of the National Innovation Award from the American Heart Association. In addition, Dr. Ashley is also leading the Medical Center's Big Data Initiative. A native of Scotland, in his spare time, he plays the saxophone and conducts research on the health benefits of single malt scotch whiskey. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ewan Ashley. All right, well, thank you, Laurie, and thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to see so many of you here on a Saturday morning, and I am very excited to talk to you about big data today. Big data is a big deal. That's what it says on my slide. It must be true. What is big data anyway is the question that I get asked most often, because this is a, a buzzword, and we're, it's a, if it's a buzzword in the rest of the world, then it's absolutely <clears throat> a buzzword here in Silicon Valley. <clears throat> so many of you are probably in the technology sector and are very used to dealing with uh, these sorts of numbers right here. But let me just remind you that uh, a character of text on a page is about a byte, right? So one page you could store in a couple of kilobytes, probably 2,000 characters on a page. Uh, a megabyte, you might find, well, these days you might find hundreds of megabytes in a USB stick that you can walk out of fries in, in Palo Alto with. Um, your laptop might have gigabytes of, of RAM, the rapid access memory. Um, when it comes to terabytes, one of the interesting things, we're talking about books, this is the National Library of Congress. It's, been, it's, it's thought that you could carry essentially every book in the National Library of Congress out of the National Library of Congress with 15 terabytes. You can get 15 terabytes on a couple of hard drives from Costco. Uh, so so, so if it's, it's now much more efficient to store because if you wanted to carry even 15 books out of the National Library of Congress, you would need uh, biceps bigger than mine. Um, this, this is a, a data center which can, can house a, a vast amount of data. We usually think of, of data centers in terms of how much energy they use. But while we're talking about uh, terabytes, let me, let me take you back to 1993. This was a golden era in the movies. Jurassic Park, you remember that? That was a classic movie. Schindler's List, of course, I think won the Oscar. Uh, the Piano, I remember. Philadelphia, amazing movie. Groundhog Day. A little less amazing, but pretty amusing. Tombstone, uh, does anyone remember Tombstone? I don't even remember that. And obviously the best movie ever made, Sleepless in Seattle, uh, 1993. Well, what else was going on in 1993? Well, the internet was getting going in 1993. It was pretty early days, but it was already there. The total internet was 100 terabytes. 100 terabytes, so that, so I looked yesterday, I did this last time I was giving a talk like this, I looked to see you could buy uh, an eight terabyte hard drive. You can pretty much buy a 10 terabyte hard drive now, which means you could hold the whole internet in your hand from 1993 with 10 of these hard drives. Things are moving at an absolutely incredible rate. I think Eric Schmidt was saying just the other day that uh, he'd calculated, or someone had calculated that almost all the information uh, that is generally available in the world today was developed and generated in the last couple of years. And you can see that if you go to any event these days, uh, you, you, know, you will see 10,000 people lift up their cameras and take photos, and, and these are being immediately uploaded. They're taking video that's being uploaded. So uh, most of the information that's being stored uh, is, is pretty, uh, is, is, has been generated pretty recently. Well, how big is the internet in 2014? Anyone got any idea? Where do, we, where do we get on our scale? We got as far as terabyte, petabyte, 50 petabytes an hour is what Google passes through Google servers, 50 petabytes an hour. That's about an exabyte a day. But if you want to know how big the internet is in 2014, it's four zettabytes, four times 10 to the 21. And so when we, we really start to talk about large numbers while we're up at zettabytes, it, it has been calculated, not by me, that if you digitize that sign at the bottom here. If you digitize all the human speech that had ever been spoken, right, every single word that came out of any human's mouth since the dawn of time, 
it would take up 400 zettabytes. So we are in an age where we can start to get our arms around an absolutely enormous amount of data. And so what do we do with all that data? I mean, that's, that's the question. I mean, if you, we have it now, we should do something good with it, shouldn't we? Well, this is one of the things that we do with all that data. This is from my Netflix queue. You can see the, uh, the movie theme continues here. I'm obviously a fan of Spider-Man. I hear the new one is very, very good. Um, these are some other fairly classic and less classic movies. I don't know about Robot Chicken. Did anyone ever, <laughs> ever, anyone ever seen Robot Chicken? Um, so how do they do that? Well, Netflix was very famous for having done a competition called the Netflix Prize, and they said there's some pretty smart people out there in the world. Many of them are right just around here, but many elsewhere too. Why don't you work out, if, if we know, if we give you like a download of just a small sliver of the Netflix data movies that some people watch, uh, then let us, you know, build a, a, a machine, build an algorithm, build a, com a computer method for telling our users what other movies they're going to like. And actually, they ended up with three different solutions that were all given the prize kind of jointly. And the Netflix algorithm, we believe, uses all of these jointly. And it, and it does pretty well. Uh, I think many of you will have used it. So who else uses this kind of technology? Well, Amazon uses it. Every time you buy something, in an, in an idea to try and get you to buy something else, Amazon are going to make some suggestions. So it's pretty obvious. This was something I did recently. This is from an actual search of mine. I, I decided to buy a, a card reader. People still give out business cards these days. And, I have a big stack of them in my office, and I thought, I need a card reader. So I bought one of those, pretty, uh, pretty cheap, though the $100. Uh, it's, obviously, I'm going to need a cable to go with it, so I suggested that. That makes sense. You don't need an algorithm to tell you you need a cable to go with a card reader. But here it says, oh, maybe you need some card files. Maybe you, need a, maybe you want to look at this other card scanner. Oh, hold on. I have a software alert. They say, maybe I want a keyboard for my for my iPad, it's making an assumption that because I'm, I'm a sort of office -y person, I'm buying. So I mean, basically, there's an algorithm inside Amazon that looks at what I buy and what other people buy uh, and decides that I, that I need uh, these office supplies. But if you look a little further down here, you get to, to this, Earth's best organic chlorine-free diapers. How do you think <laughs> that connects to the office supply? Well, it turns out that Amazon knows that I had a baby. I, my wife had a baby last year. <laughs> In, in, in Scotland, uh, we put our babies in whiskey boxes, just so you can see. A friend of mine actually does baby photography. So this is, our, this is uh, Cameron, uh, Cameron Ashley, who is now uh, 11 months old. But this was him at uh, six days old, uh, stored in his uh, white label Dewar Scottish whiskey box. And looking pretty comfortable. So Amazon knows, I never told Amazon I had a baby. But Amazon knows that I had a baby and wants to make sure I have enough diapers. Yeah. And that's pretty smart. I actually don't mind that. I think there are people clearly who would worry about a computer knowing that you'd had a baby and trying to sell you that. But I actually personally find that quite useful. But of course, we're not here to talk about diapers. <laughs> and we're not here really to talk about Netflix or Amazon. We're here to talk about how can we use that kind of technology to make your lives better and, and to do medicine better than we currently do it. How can we, instead of personalizing my, my Amazon gift list, how can we personalize medicine using big data? And that's what we're going to talk about. Well, this is one of the obvious ways to do that. I, let's see a show of hands. How many people are either wearing or are connected to some kind of quantified health device, a watch or a phone or, yeah. It's, around this part of the world, there's, there's quite a few of us. I have a, I'm not endorsing anyone in particular. I have a basis watch on, but my phone has a Fitbit app in it. And, we do quite, I'm a cardiologist, as, as Laurie mentioned, by, by training. Uh, I'm kind of a geek by birth and then a cardiologist by training. So that's, that's how that works. Um, and and uh, one of the reasons I love cardiology is because measuring the heart is, is, is something uh, that is really interesting. And you can measure it like this. It's an actual ECG. So this is the electrical tracing from a heart that you can now get from your phone just by holding. If you put on a little attachment and just hold it on your phone, it'll take your ECG. Uh, I have an ultrasound machine which can show me moving pictures of the heart. I'll show you uh, a heart in a moment uh, that fits in my pocket now. So we have, we have that. This very fashionable looking wearable unit um, here uh, is, is also something else you can get and can measure electrical signals from your biceps as well as from your heart. Uh, this is Moves, which is an app for your phone, which uh, will just take the accelerometer data from your phone and, and you can download it. And honestly, I have absolutely no idea what this is. I just, <laughs> I just thought it was a, an interesting picture. Uh, brain waves, or I, it, it looks pretty cool. So, 
So that's one way that we can personalize medicine. We can, we can essentially download new data. And you have control of that. Your doctor doesn't have control of that. Your doctor is probably a bit scared of what you might bring into the office you know, in the form of quantified self data. But at Stanford in particular, we want to change that. <clears throat> and we want to welcome this kind of data, incorporate it in your medical record, and, and, and make your care more personal as a result of it. But of course, when we think about <clears throat> what we're doing with your health data, we normally think of something called the EMR, the electronic medical record, which is where we are today. Traditionally, though, when your doctor is making decisions about you and you have a, a challenge that you bring your doctor, your doctor, this is a much more attractive doctor than I here, um, <laughs> but the point of the, uh, the point of the message is to say that when, when she's trying to make a decision about your care, she's thinking about all the other patients that she's seen over the last decade, 20, 10, 20 years. Well, she doesn't look like she's qualified that long, but anyway. Um, it's, it's the patient experience that really drives medical decision making. And there's one other place that we get data from, and that is the gold standard is, is the medical literature. And that is something called the randomized controlled trial. So the randomized controlled trial is the way that doctors judge levels of evidence. It has to be randomized because otherwise there's bias. If, if some people want to sign up for one treatment, some people want to sign up for another, you're introducing bias at the beginning. So what you do is blind the treatment. You don't tell the doctor or the patient which treatment they're getting, <clears throat> and you toss a coin, and depending on the way the coin goes, one person gets treatment X and one person gets treatment Y. And that's the only way you can be really sure when you test treatment X versus treatment Y, or the two groups of people who got each one, that X is really better than Y. And so that, that's randomized and it's controlled. You have to have two groups. And that's the gold standard. And so we can go to, you can, much of this available on, on Google now, so you can, you can do this without any of what I'm going to talk about. You can go to Google, you can look up th that information or the medical literature and find the results of the randomized controlled trial. The problem with that is that drug companies spend an enormous amount of money invested in developing drugs. I mean, the estimate is usually around two or three billion dollars to get a drug on the market, but actually that, doesn't, that number hides behind it the drugs that fail. If you add in the drugs that, that fail, uh, in order to get one drug to market, most drug companies have to spend 10 to 12 billion dollars. So when you hear about drug companies making a lot of money, it's, it's good for them and we're happy for them, but the investment they have to make to get one drug to market is about to bankrupt our healthcare system. And so one of the things we're interested in, again, around big data at Stanford is how do we help with that? And, and one of the challenges is if you spent that much money developing your drug, you're gonna be really, really careful about who you let into a trial to test it. You're not gonna let anyone with any funny rare conditions in. You might not let kids in. We we're just talking about that. You might decide it's only gonna be in adults. It's only gonna be in white males. You might. They're not really allowed to say that, but you know, most of our data has come from that group of, of people. Certainly, if you happen to have two or three other conditions, let's say you don't just have high blood pressure, but you also have diabetes, which is pretty common, then you're not gonna be let in the trial either because they want to keep it as tight as possible. And what that means is when your doctor comes to make a decision about the patient in front of her, then the, the data that she has to do that is based on these tightly controlled trials. And, and, and there isn't really a lot of data on patients like you patients like hers. So one of, what, what, is there a better way to do that? And, and this paper was published by some of our colleagues here at Stanford in the New England Journal a couple of years ago, and it demonstrates exactly that, a glimpse of the future. Uh, it's called, I mean, the title is Evidence-Based Medicine and EMR. So here's George Clooney looking for your medical record. <laughs> He's got a few more gray hairs now, but um, show me your medical record. Well, at Stanford, we have one called EPIC. That's pretty much the one that is used across the world. Um, and, and we have this idea that when you go to look for the medical record, uh, then you have something like this. It doesn't really look like that. Um, actually, it looks a bit more like, like this, uh, because we have one at Stanford called Stride, and basically every day, a D identified, which means the names don't go with it, and the identifiers don't go with it, but all the other data from all the medical records in both hospitals get put in a large database. And so the researchers at Stanford can look at that. They can't identify anyone with it, within it, but they can look at it and see. So what happens if you get a patient, in this case a patient with a rare condition, systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, who was having clots, and they were trying to make a decision as to whether to use a blood thinner. Is that safe, or could that make things worse? There's no, there's no study uh, that can speak to that. You go to medical literature all you want, you don't find a study that answers that question. So is it possible to go to our actual EMRs, like the billions of data points that we have stored every day, and answer that question? And in fact, in the study, uh, that's exactly what, what they did and created a, 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 an actual statistic using that about their, their likely risk of giving that medication. And based on, based on looking up our own big data set here at Stanford, 
they made that decision to go ahead and, and, and look forward. And that's just one of the ways that we think we can do medicine better in the new world. What we'd like to do is connect the Stanford data set with the rest of the UC data sets. We'd like to connect that large data set with the rest of the US data sets, and we'd like to connect those with the rest of the world. Because that's what Google does, and if Google can do it, and they're just down the road, and they were taught by some of our colleagues here at Stanford before they went off on their own to do that, I, I think we can do it in healthcare. And, and that's the challenge that we have in front of us. And it's one I think that we can achieve, because all the pieces are in place, we just haven't brought them together yet. All right. I'd like to tell you about networks. I, I, I love networks, and we're in a part of the world where networks uh, are something we talk about at all, uh, a, a lot. Uh, in particular, does anyone know what that is? Probably. Facebook, correct. That is the Facebook campus as seen through Google Maps. Uh, <laughs> see how many tech companies I can mention in one, uh, in one sentence. So I use this actually, I talk about networks quite a lot. I, I'm going to spare you a lot of the, the technical details today. But I often use this picture because when we try to think about genes that move together, when we try to think about proteins that move together, when we try to think of any kind of biological entity that moves together, I think it's quite helpful to think of a business. Because w what you're interested in is who goes for coffee together, who works in the same building together, who drove in from the same part of the world. If you're trying to work out the function of, let's say, a gene, or you're, if more than that, you're interested in the genes it hangs out with. And so the social media analogy is actually very useful for a lot of the work we do in genetic networks. And I'll tell you just a little bit about that moving forward. But graph theory, which is the name of that area of science, started with this guy, Leonard Euler, in the 1700s. This is the, the, the so-called seven bridges of Konigsberg problem. And Leonard Euler is famous for a negative. He's famous for proving that something was not possible. In particular, that it was not possible to walk from one end of Konigsberg to the other, uh, only crossing one bridge. And Konigsberg is interesting because it has these two large uh, island masses and basically these seven bridges that connect them. And he showed really laying the foundations for graph theory back in the 1700s uh, that th this couldn't be done. Um, but there's some more, more modern versions of this and, and sometimes called the small world idea. This guy, Stanley Milgram, very, very classic experiment, 1960s at Harvard. Who knows who paid him to do this experiment? Maybe he didn't get paid to do it. Maybe he just thought he'd do it one day. But it's a sort of interesting experiment. He got 160 letters. He put them in the mail. No email at that time. He sent them to random people in Omaha, Nebraska. I have no idea why he decided to send them to Omaha, Nebraska. But on this letter, it said nothing but please send on to John Smith, who happened to be a Boston stockbroker, or anyone you think is more likely than you to know John Smith. That is literally, now, if I sent 160 letters, first of all, nobody would read them. They'd be in the trash because nobody reads their mail anymore. But um, people read their mail. And in fact, 42 out of 160 made it back. And they made it to John Smith in Boston with only two to 10 intermediary steps with a path length, therefore, of five. That's kind of amazing. Now, some of you may have heard of this, this game in the modern era, a somewhat less classic experiment. It was a drinking game that some college kids came up with called the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon game. Anyone ever heard of that? Yes. So basically, this became a national phenomenon after they went on the John Stewart show. And here's the basic idea. Yeah, you, you have a few drinks with your friends, then someone randomly mentions an actor, and you have to connect that actor with Kevin Bacon through movies that they've shared. So let me tell you about the greatest Scottish actor of all time, Sean Connery. <laughs> you want to connect Sean Connery with Kevin Bacon? Sean Connery was in The Untouchables, 1987 great movie, with Stephen Burroughs, who was in a less great movie, She's Having a Baby, with Kevin Bacon. And so you can connect Sean Connery to Kevin Bacon by a path length, too. And it turns out that you can connect people with very short path lengths even across the world. I mean, you might have heard you can connect yourself to anyone in the world in six steps. Does that sound reasonable? Actually, it probably does. One of our faculty here in computer science, Yuri Leskovic, did this study with Eric Horvitz at Microsoft. So this is an old study. I'll tell you the Facebook number in a minute, 2008. But at the time, the largest graph ever connected. This is 30 billion conversations. 240 million people, and I even put the graph there for you. The, the path length uh, was 4.7, I think it was, the peak, you know, just after, above five. Twitter was 4.7, I'm getting my numbers middle up. Um, five point something. So you really can connect 240 million people across the world with a very short path length. It turns out that people really are connected. And, and the latest one uh, from Facebook, which is 740 million people, uh, the, the number was also around five. It seems that that is pretty much a universal phenomenon. So here's another question for you. If we start to think about applying this to the human genome, how many gene networks might there be? And we're gonna, I'm gonna, gonna help you out, make you a couple of assumptions. We're gonna call a gene network 20, 20 different nodes, and I'm gonna give you a clue 
I'm going to tell you how many genes are in the human genome. Anyone happen to know? But pretty good, pretty good. We used to think there was about 40,000 because we found plants that had you know, 20,000. We thought we must have more genes than them. And we realize now we have less genes than even strawberries and so that's another, you know. So it's not about the genes. But yes, let's call it 20,000 genes and 20 gene networks. And let's say they have to, they're not allowed to overlap. Uh, anyone got any ideas? I'd be surprised if you've seen a number this large before. But the good news is, you see, you don't have to calculate it. I see you taking notes. I was wondering if you're doing a calculation there. Just to <laughs> <laughs> this is the binomial coefficient. You need factorial mathematics to do this. But the good news is your iPhone will do this for you. Your iPhone is connected to Wolfram Alpha, which is a mathematical encyclopedia. You can try this later. Go and ask Siri. Doesn't work for me because she doesn't understand a word I say. <laughs> but feel free to try it. I think probably your accent will work better than mine. Um, and say this, the words you have to say are 20,000 choose 20, and, and Siri will interpret that if you say it in the right accent uh, as 20,000, you know, with 20 underneath it, and these matrix bars, and here's the number, four times 10 to the 67. You probably haven't ever said this number before, 42 unvigintillion, 692 vigintillion, 100, I'm not gonna repeat the rest for you. That is a very large number, in fact, there are only something like 10 to the 22 stars in the known universe. So it's a larger number than that. And somebody much smarter than me calculated that likely the number of atoms in the entire universe is about 10 to the 80. So it's close to that. So if we want to, my, my point with all this is we want to start working out how genes work together in the human genome. We're not gonna do it one at a time. And we're, if I want to do any of it while I'm still alive, we're gonna have to find a better way. And I think the better way is using the, this and these network models. So if we're gonna apply some network models to the human genome, where do we start? This is a microarray, something that was invented right here at Stanford. And it's actually, this one was built by Agilent. And actually they have a kind of big inkjet printer essentially that spritzes little DNA molecules onto each one of these slides. And you can see the resolution with which it, it does that. There's about 20,000 on this slide. And each one represents one gene in the human genome. So if you can find some tissue that is of interest that might be for a disease you want to find a, a new drug for, let's say heart failure, I'm a cardiologist, then you can use one of these microarrays to tell you about the genes in the genome. Well, I hope you're not feeling too squeamish this morning. I thought I'd show you a piece of cardiac surgery. Um, so, because what happens is that sometimes patients, and I have one patient having this operation this morning, um, if their heart gets weak, then one of the things we can do if a heart transplant isn't yet available is put in, and I know you're not listening to me now, you're just looking at the video, but, um, <laughs> so I'm just gonna talk. Um, one of the things we can do is put in an artificial heart device. And the artificial heart device doesn't, you don't take the heart out itself, some blood coming now just to warn you. Um, but but you, put, you put an extra heart in if you like, a, a pump that pumps itself and offloads the heart. It takes blood out of the heart and then pumps it into the circulation. Um, and, and this can offload the heart and actually allow the heart to recover a bit. And, but more than that, it allows the patient to do well because all the other organs are now getting enough blood. And they're getting enough blood uh, and that means they can recover. And then by the time that the heart the transplant is actually available, and this is a heart transplant down at the bottom here, um, then the heart and the rest of the body are in a much better state. And it used to be that we did this very, very rarely and we did heart transplants much more often. But last year for the first time, we did more of these kinds of procedures at Stanford than we did of heart transplants. And there are now patients walking around who don't even want a heart transplant. They say, I'm just gonna stick with this pump. And so that's one of the things. Now, obviously, I'm not just showing you this so I can show you an operation or some blood on the screen, though I like to do that. Um, I'm showing you this because you will notice they took the core of the heart out. So the, the, they took some tissue out of the core of the heart. And if you take a piece out here, and then when the, when the heart actually is taken out at the time of transplant, you can compare those two. If you compare those two, you find new things. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm skipping a bit of the story here. We found a new gene that looked like it might be able to, to help for heart failure. And so we found uh, the, the ligand for the receptor, so the lock and the key. And, and we started, this about eight years ago, we started an experiment. The first thing we did was find a little friend like this, little mouse, and injected some of this in and see if the mouse could run faster. It turned out the mouse could run faster. It turned out the heart, his heart was stronger. We even got little heart cells and put them in a dish. You can pick a single heart cell up with a carbon fiber shown here. And here's a video of the, of the carbon fiber stretching the heart muscle cell. This is one single heart muscle cell and you can measure the force that one single heart muscle cell produces. And we did that and then we gave this new molecule and the heart pumped better. 
And then basically over the course of several years, we, we put together a whole lot more information, including safety, till we got to the point where we're saying, well, we should give this to people to see if it makes their heart work better. And then we actually couldn't do that fast enough in the US, so some of my colleagues in Edinburgh uh, were able to inject, this is not them, but picture like them, um, were able to inject this into humans and measure, and what they found, just shown here, this is just a one, one slide, if you look at the top, that's the output from the heart. And after they injected this, this peptide, this little protein, the output from the heart went up, and the bottom slide shows the, the, the load on the heart, which went down. And so now this, we started with this microarray experiment, some heart tissue, we did this network modeling. It, it told us about which hub gene is most likely to be important. That's, that's where the network takes us. It takes us to, to the, 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 the really key network hubs, like you can think of if there's, if there's bad weather over, over JFK or Chicago here, the whole system is much more messed up than if we have bad weather in, in Reno, Nevada. And that's what we do there with the network model. That took us all the way through to this molecule and all the way to the point where we could give it uh, back to humans to improve their heart function. There's now three different pharmaceutical companies developing this as a drug. So I think that it's, it's more than theory. We can, we can use this graph theory to help make very smart hypotheses about where to go. And, and our aim here at Stanford is to take it all the way back to the patient and make new therapies and do it faster and cheaper than we did before. Okay, so the third thing I want to tell you about is the genome revolution. And you might have heard that many years ago, you probably remember this, 2001, the draft sequence of the human genome was presented by Craig Venter, Francis Collins, and just off the screen was, is Bill Clinton. Uh, this was a 10-year project. It was funded for $3 billion and involved 10 countries and thousands of scientists. It was an incredible effort to get a draft sequence of the human genome. Uh, and the next uh, one that came after that was Craig Venter's genome himself, and that cost about $100 million. It's shown on this graph. Here's time, 2001. I'm going to bring you right up to date to 2014. And, and one of the, so when we talk about technology moving fast, in the early part of the talk here, we talked about technology and how fast it was and how much more data there is. Well, we sometimes think of something that was coined by Gordon Moore, who along with Bob Noyes was really one of the founders of, of Intel. And computers were moving so fast and we were able to put so many more transistors on silicon that he said, well, every 18 months that the capacity doubles. And they, that became known as Moore's Law. And that's what's shown here. And, and you can see an amazingly steep decline uh, in the cost of computing sort of overlaid on the cost of genome sequencing. Something amazing happened in 2008. Genome sequencing left Moore's Law, which already was incredibly fast technology development, in the dust. You know, and we got to the point where uh, when I got into this field in 2009, it cost about $250,000 to do a genome, which itself was mind-blowing, because the one before that cost $3 million. Uh, And then, you know, and next year it cost $50,000. A month ago, this machine uh, was, was uh, promoted uh, by Illumina or launched by Illumina. This machine will sequence your genome for $800. We are at the $1,000 genome. It's something we, we've talked about for many years. We are, we are there. This can be done. And we've moved at this unbelievable rate. Now, I show this graph a lot, and it, uh, you know, it, I think the graph and the steep decline is meaningful, but much more meaningful to me is Ferraris, right? <laughs> and I, for many months, drove past this Ferrari on El Camino, you know, for Ferrari uh, and Maserati. So I look, this, this is $400,000, and I, I have to tell you, I have to break the bad news to you that Stanford faculty do not get paid enough to afford a Ferrari. So this is not in my garage right now. I don't own this. If this Ferrari dropped in price as much as human genome sequencing dropped in price, you know how much it would cost? 40 cents. <laughs> in fact, I even updated this slide after that machine was announced, and the new price, sales price just for you today, <laughs> 10 cents this Ferrari costs. So that's a Ferrari for everybody in the room. Somebody said, you're not going to talk like Oprah, are you? I said, well, I'm going to give cars away. Well, here's a car for everybody. <laughs> Everybody in the room, 10 cents for this Ferrari. It's absolutely astounding. And, and it's really unprecedented within science, as far as I can tell. I've been involved in a few different areas of science. This is unbelievable at what is possible. And so it led us to this idea a few years ago. What if, if we can really do this for $800 and an MRI costs you 3,000, you know, what if everybody's genome was available in their medical record? What could we do then? Well, shortly after that moment of, of I think joy, we, we came with the realization that that would mean analyzing six billion data points. And six billion data points when you can basically make one error and miss this. This is a normal heart, the one you just uh, saw, or at least that was pumping. 
And this is the heart of a, an athlete who died suddenly from a condition known as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a, a condition for which we have a specialist center here at Stanford. You can see the wall thickness is three times longer. The cavity size is very small. Um, one letter out of six billion is what changes that heart on the left to that heart on the right. So we have a challenge. We have six billion data points and we have to move. So what we did, you know, what do you do when you have a problem? You, you call your friends. So that's what I did. I called uh, Ross Altman, who's my friend of bioengineering, who built, uh, had a database for all the pharmacogenomic variants, the variants that in your genome that tell you about what drugs to take. Atul Butte, one of my friends uh, here in bioinformatics, who'd been building variant databases. And uh, our own team had been thinking about how to, how to interpret uh, large scale uh, genome variation. So we got together. Uh, and we built things like this. We said, well, if your doctor's gonna have to talk to you about your genome and there's six billion data points, you go, that's a lot, that's a big book. So, uh, so wh why don't we try to put in large font the things that you have genetic risk for? Why don't we have the environmental variables around the side? Why don't we include all the interactions? And this might be something a bit like what your doctor could talk to you about. Uh, and I've summarized, of course, a, a large amount of work in one, in one picture. Um, but if, if this is the old world, and some of you might, might find this familiar, you go to see your doctor, your doctor says, well, your blood pressure is a bit high. And the patient says, what do you suggest? The doctor says, well, take this medicine. So you come back, no, I, I, that didn't work. It didn't make any difference. So your doctor says, well, I'll try this one instead. And then you say, well, I have a cough. And your doctor says, well, no, try this other one. And you say, well, maybe it's a little better. And they say, well, try this other one. And then that's basically what we're doing right now is we, we take things and throw them at the wall and see if it works. That's literally how we treat high blood pressure. You might think your doctor's very smart. I'm sure they are. But this is how we treat high blood pressure. We take one drug and we try it, then we try the next one, and then we, and we wait till one works. Well, how about if we had, how about if this was the conversation? Your blood pressure is a bit high. The patient says, well, what do you suggest? So the doctor says, well, let me go check your genome. And I might find what drug's actually gonna work for you. And more than that, what drug is gonna minimize the side effects? That's what you want. You want the drug that's gonna work for you. And in this, one example for this patient is actually was our colleague here in bioengineering. We had an example of being able to choose a cholesterol medication in exactly this way. We had genome guided medicine for the first time. And of course, then your patient's very, you know, <laughs> very happy, happy with that. So we published this, I think we talked about it at the beginning. We actually very briefly became kind of slightly celebrities. There were 300 news stories about this. We're now currently in the Smithsonian. The White House invited us to talk about it, just one of those, those things. But I show this slide so I can show you this. Anytime you're a celebrity, it's important to remember. This is Google News, and this is the news stories that came out over the course of the day after this work came out. You can see when it came out in Europe, there was a big peak here. About 8 a.m. it came out in the US, big peak here. And by 4 p.m., nobody cared. <laughs> so, that's very important if you're ever brushing with, have a brush with celebrity. Uh, where I come from, we say, you know, yesterday's news is today's fish and chip wrapping. Because you, <laughs> you, eat, you eat fish and chips from newspaper. So I'm gonna finish with this uh, story, which is where we are today. That work was from a few years ago. We're now at the point where we can do a thousand dollar genome, and just in the last month, we launched a genome service specifically in the hospital. So building on this work on the research side. This is a baby who was uh, tragically born early, had heart block, and uh, we didn't know what was wrong, and we found out uh, when she was born that the, the resetting, the electrical resetting of her heart was, was abnormal. And so this is a condition called long QT syndrome, and it can result in cardiac arrest, and this little baby had five cardiac arrests in the first day of life. A really tragic uh, circumstance. We treated at the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital here with a defibrillator that was implanted in her, in her belly. And so that was able to bring, bring her heart back when it did this here, which is this nasty looking rhythm down here. This is bad. And this is more normal rhythm here. Right now, if we wanted to do a genetic test for that condition, and this is one of the few conditions where knowing the gene can actually help with the medication that you're going to give. Not all conditions are like that, but this condition, you classify the condition according to the gene. Right now, it takes us three months to do eight genes, and it costs $5,000. And that's not good enough. That's just simply not good enough. In the new world, we can send uh, to Illumina, and we did this in her case, uh, for a whole genome sequencing. This is an amazing technological advance, right? So currently, it takes three months to get eight genes. In three days, we can get the whole genome back. And so in this case, we brought the whole genome back, we analyzed it, and on day seven of life, we were able to tell the treating team, this is what's causing the problem, and this is the drug that you should use. So this is real, it's happening today, She's doing very well as an outpatient, and we're happy about that, and we're happy that we know what the underlying cause is, because we do think it has helped in the treatment decisions. 
I want this not just for little babies with tragic situations like this, and I hope she grows up to be, to be a happy uh, young girl and, and learn about genetics and learn about the, the, the foundational work that was done to, to lead to this. But I want it for each one of you. I want personalized medicine based on big data for everybody in the room, and I hope you should too. That's all I've got for you. Thanks for joining me today, and thanks for uh, coming along. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, please, sir. The microphone, I think, is just coming from on your right. <clears throat> if we had our genome tested and identified, would that be data that's appropriate for the rest of our life? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you, is your genome the same today as it is the rest of your life? And basically, the answer to that is yes. I, I'll give you a small caveat at the end. But this is the good news, is that, if, I mean, and you could have this, this little baby's genome is basically we know what it is now. So for the rest of her life, we know what the genome is. Every time that a situation comes up where there might be a reason to go look in the genome, literally every time we, we have a medication that we want to describe, uh, pros prescribe, or every time a, maybe another condition comes up or anything else, that genome is now available for us to look at. So that's one of the things. For, for $1,000, it's now there. So we need to work on how, to, how it goes in the medical record so that it can just be looked up. There's a the study of, of, of doctors which said, if you were going, would you use a genetic test in prescribing if it was available today? And most of the doctors said, well, I don't really know what to do with that, and I, I want to write the prescription today. I want to write it now. I don't want to wait three weeks for a test to come back. We turned the question around and asked the same doctors, if the genome was in the medical record, so that at the point you're prescribing it just pops up, would you use it? 100%, absolutely, every single case. So that's what we're, that's what we're aiming for. And I think the transition point, <coughs> The initial point isn't that everybody will suddenly get their genomes done. I think what will happen is that every time somebody needs a genetic test, they'll just have their genome sequenced, and then it'll be available, and they won't need a genetic test again. So, uh, yeah, please. So the question I have, that since this is so early in the process, I mean, clearly this has phenomenal opportunity. But since it's so early, one of the concerns you hear is that Okay, so you get the genome. Now, since people don't really know what all the, how this stuff interacts, now you, you may have all these things that like, oh wait, I might have this problem, I might have that problem. And suddenly it's like, how do you, you know, it, it's kind of the, the flip side of it. When there's so many things that could potentially go wrong, which may never go wrong in your life, now you're suddenly concerned about them. Okay, so I, I think if I can restate your question, you're worried that if, if everybody gets their genome done, they'll find they have risk for different diseases that may or may not be relevant. And so there's a very important point that's held within that. And, and, and what it is is that your genome can tell you about your risk of getting a disease. But in most cases, it doesn't tell you for sure you're going to get the disease because that's, that's dependent on a lot of other things. It's amazing when we look at most diseases, we find that in, in many, many cases, it turns out that 50% is genetically determined and 50% is the environment. So the nature-nurture argument often turns out to be about 50-50 when we really look. And in heart disease, that's, that's very much the case. About half your risk is in your genes, and you can't fix that. But the other half, you can. So I'm not going to stop telling people to do diet and exercise because of their genome. You know, everybody should be exercise. You guys should be walking out. You know, when you leave here. You know, can't can't see a cardiologist without some lifestyle advice. You know, so I'm not I'm not going to be changing that. But but to speak to your specific issue, because we actually studied this recently. We what we did with a we published this paper just a couple of months ago. We sequenced a small number of patients here at Stanford. And then we took the genome data to their doctors and said, you know, we've done all this genome sequencing. There's a lot of concern that we suddenly sequence everyone's genome and now you want to order lots of tests. We worry the patient, we bankrupt the healthcare system. And so we asked them, what, what tests do you want to run? And the average cost of follow-up testing from a genome was $500. So you add the $800 to the $500 and you're still half the cost of an ultrasound. So when, well, the, the numbers in our, in our healthcare system are enormous. And actually, I, I wonder if this technology might even save money, but we don't have the evidence for that yet. Good. Uh, here's Nick, yeah. Uh, one, thank you for a very entertaining talk. Oh, you're kind, thank you. <laughs> um, Two-part question. One is the example with baby S, mm -hmm. it was very clear there was a defect you could pinpoint. Yeah. How many disease conditions can you pinpoint with that certainty, with that precision? Yeah. And the second part of my question is to follow on to the first gentleman's question. You do incur mutations over time and SNP changes. Are those relevant from this one time you do the genome? Yeah, okay. Good, so let me deal with the first one first. I, I think that almost, the, the corollary of that we can't explain every condition with the genes is that actually almost every condition has a genetic component. So there's, there's, 
increasingly now we can say something about almost every genetic condition. The number of diseases that, are, that, are, that we know enough about to know they're defined by the genes, where we can do genetic tests and radically change, of course those are in the minority. But one statistic that's interesting is that, the, so the rare diseases is where that's gonna be. And you think rare diseases, that's maybe not, that's not relevant to me, but actually one in 17 people in the country has a rare disease, because there's a lot of rare diseases, right? So they are individually rare, but collectively common. So, and, and so this technology would be relevant just in the rare disease portion for, for one in 17 people, but, but it can also say a lot about heart disease, about diabetes, about all the, the much more common diseases. It just has a little less to say, but there are quite a lot of examples uh, like this. To speak to the other part then, the, the, the genome changing, that I didn't get to my, my caveat to you, sir. Well, there's a couple of ways that that, that can happen. The, the principal one is in cancer. And, and what happens in cancer is, is that the the genome of certain cells gets mutated in a way that those cells start to, to grow kind of out of control. And so if, you, if you're sequencing cancer, you have a much harder problem because you have multiple genomes to sequence. And so that's one way in which the genome uh, it, it's, it's, it changes. The, what we call the germline genome, which is the genome of every other cell in the body, that doesn't change. So that still, that still contains your risk for cancer and can tell you a lot. Um, the other thing is that there's something we now call epigenetics, which is, Kind of a grand irony for the way genetics went, because you probably heard in, in school about Lamarck, who thought that you know things in your environment could be passed on to future generations, whereas Darwin said that that wouldn't happen, and Mend Gregor Mendel eventually said that wouldn't happen. The grand irony of genetics is it turns out that can happen in a little way, in that you can alter the, the <clears throat> not the genome sequence itself, but some of the of the the way the genome is is put together, um, and so. You can inherit that. So there's a, there's a little way in which your environment will change the, uh, let's see, the, whether, whether your genome is sort of open or closed for business at certain certain parts, and that's called epigenetics. Uh, yes, please. You know, one of the major problems we face is inequality. In this country and probably throughout the world, the riches are getting richer, mm -hmm. and the, the people at the opposite end of the, of the spectrum are getting poorer, and clearly richer can have access to better health and the others the opposite. So my question is, do you think genomics uh, are going to increase, is going to increase this inequality, or is there avenues where it may reduce the gap? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, there's actually a conference on an annual basis uh, specifically about this issue, you know, genetics in the world, in a world of inequality. <clears throat> and I think it speaks to exactly the issue you say. I mean, it seems at first look like this is something for kind of rich people, you know, this is something, and certainly it's something that we, we can do at Stanford before they can do it in a small rural hospital in, in Gambia, let's say, you know, that, that's for sure. But let me tell you about, we just, we, as part of our big data initiative here at, at Stanford, of course it includes genomics, it goes beyond genomics. One of the, the grants that we recently funded, and we had a seed grant program, about a million dollars, we asked, uh, actually do this in combination with Oxford University, so Stanford and Oxford faculty, we said get together, give us your best ideas, we'll, we'll fund, you know, 10 of you, $100,000 each. We had several that were based around work in the, third, in the developing world. And one in particular, which is really amazing, let me just tell you quickly about it. There's a new sequencer, I didn't talk about it here, that is the size of a USB stick. It's kind of amazing. Uh, and it, it, it's a little pore that pulls the DNA molecule through and it and reads it as it goes through. And it, what it allows is point of care genetic testing. Now, it's, it's not good enough yet to do point of care like, you, you know, you stick your thumb in here, it tells you your genome, that's not there. But, but actually, even although we, we, you know, I was saying that we're not much more sophisticated than bacteria, Bacterial genome is actually a little easier to sequence, it turns out. And so his, his uh, application that we funded was to take that USB stick into the developing world and sequence the bugs that were causing the infectious disease that caused everyone. Because if you, can, if you can sequence the bug, you can treat it better. So actually I think there's lots of ways in which this kind of technology can get into the developing world and reduce inequality. Um, and so I, and, and I'm excited about how we can do that in this country as well. So, great question. Last question, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, I read that some people are saying that we might be over um, optimistic about how far we can get with uh, gene sequencing and that there's a more difficult problem like above that, which is it's not just associating a disease with a, you know, a broken gene mm -hmm. or, or a specific sequence, but it's the interaction of the, all the proteins, that that's the real conversation going on in the body. And I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that, if, if that might account for ultimately a better explanatory sort of power, but it's further off. Yeah, you were obviously talking to an immunologist, weren't you? 
<laughs> yeah. No, I, it's a really good question. I, I mean, I, I don't want to pretend for a minute that the genome explains everything. If we think about how our cells work, we start with a recipe book, which is the, the genes and the DNA, and they make proteins, which are the, the, the molecules that do the work of the cell. Uh, and, and they can also be identified and they can also be uh, changed in certain ways that, uh, that speak to the regulation of the cell. But the, the important thing is that, that it basically it all matters, right? And so I, th I think that there's gonna be a large number of, of uh, diseases, and they're the ones like this baby had, they're the rare diseases I just mentioned that one in 17 people have, which are primarily explained by the genetics. They're genetic diseases, right? So in this case, most of the action is there. But there's a bunch of people who have mystery diseases that we don't understand, and, and we can't find a gene for them, we can't find it. And, and, and what we need then is to develop this kind of technology, and it's happening. Again, it's happening here at Stanford. We have one of the most amazing immune cores, for example, to look at proteins, look at antibodies, uh, anywhere in the world. And, and I think when, when we're not finding an answer at the gene level, we have to, to move to that. There's a lot of disease, for example, is, is autoimmune. Your immune system kind of turns on, its, on, on yourself to attack your own organ. That's a very important c category of diseases. Um, there are ways in which genome sequencing can help with that, but it's primarily a disease of the, of the antibody. Ultimately, what we want to do, and this is why this, the title of the talk is Big Data, we have to integrate all of that information. We have to think about the genome, we have to think about the proteome, the autoantibodyome, the, I could go on, you know, quite some time. But one study last year on one individual, our chair of genetics here, Mike Snyder, attempted to do all of that, literally all of that, over the course of a six month period. In the middle of it, absolutely fascinating, he got diabetes. He didn't know that was gonna happen. He had a viral illness, which he knew because the virus sequenced the virus in his blood, because he was sequencing his blood every few weeks. I mean, he would call me up and say, you and it's great, I've got a cold. And I'd, <laughs> I'd say, well, what? He said, you need to come and take my blood. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, so I go and take it. So he did every measurement, the largest number of measurements ever made on any single individual anywhere. There's a paper published last year from Mike Snyder. Um, and, and including in that were all these, these different technologies. And, and our idea was that it may be possible, the genome, is, the, the genome is just the beginning. We have all those other ohms, you know, who knows where we're gonna be, and there's a big O at the end of hello. Anyway, I think that's the last question, and thank you all so much for being here. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.